Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Bicon uh, webcast. What we will be uh, sharing with you today is a procedure uh, for the uh, placement of a Bicon implant in the area of the maxillary right first bicuspid. Uh, the space uh, is uh, quite adequate for a Bicon short implant with a height of slightly uh, over 10 millimeters. Uh, between the crest of the bone and the floor of the maxillary sinus and uh, mesiodistally at the narrowest which is right at uh, the crest of the bone we do have uh, a little over 7.5 uh, uh, millimeters. Our intention is to place an implant that is within the confines of the crest. We will avoid uh, the sinus floor, we will avoid the adjacent teeth and if part of the implant is uh, visible through the uh, bone at the crest, we will cover that with an autogenous and possibly a synthograft uh, bone graft and uh, use a membrane to control uh, all of the graft and keep it in position. You see that there is a slight buccal defect that's easily visible. We will begin our incision by outlining the distal extent right at the crest and we will go right up to the mucogingival junction then take a posterior turn okay and we will extend this back up doesn't need to go too far up make sure that the incision is through the periosteum, it's very loose mucosa, okay? I want to make sure that this goes right against the bone. We will then turn it to preserve the papilla of the canine and then continue on past the mucogingival junction and then right up to give it the paddle shape appearance, okay? We'll begin the uh, dissection of the flap. We will be using synthograft if we need to expand the volume. And the synthograft needs to be mixed only with autogenous blood. This is the apex of the bicuspid. This is the apex of the canine. Our implant is going to sit somewhere in this neighborhood. Take a bite of the subepithelial layer. Okay, so we have the sinus floor at roughly this level, which is uh, you know, consistent with what the radiograph showed us and it is at the level of the apex of the second bicuspid. So we want to anchor our implant just before the floor of the sinus. Since we are going to be placing an implant that is about six to eight millimeters in length, we will make our osteotomy, initial pilot osteotomy, to a depth first of six millimeters to make sure that our location and angulation is acceptable. Slightly angled uh, mesially, we can easily rectify that since we haven't committed to the full depth of it. Okay. You have to use a kind of a pumping action. We are at eight millimeters. The bands on the Bicon uh, instrumentation are um, between six and eight, and then between 11 and 14. So I don't want to reach the, uh, the second band because that will mean I've uh, gone into the sinus. And so we are now at roughly about nine millimeters or 10 millimeters. Okay, we've corrected the angulation. This is 2.5 millimeters. 
we are at a depth of about eight millimeters and this is about nine what we see again is uh, the the same markings the first band begins at six the second at 11 the first band is between six and eight the second is between 11 and 14 are you okay mm -hmm. good man okay we're starting to collect a little bit of blood uh, excuse me bone and this is a crucial uh, reamer because this is the one that I use mostly to determine the actual bone density plus it is probably the first size implant that I would uh, use uh, in case we want to stop reaming and just uh, uh, place an implant. My goal is to use a 4.5 certainly uh, at least a 4 millimeter uh, implant. We are now um, at 8 millimeter from the mesial and distal bone we are now, excuse me, at six, now eight. Now just about 10. Okay. If you look closely, you see that the uh, bone, although it's still existent uh, in uh, the facial, it's actually so thin as to be translucent. Before I continue, I will make sure that uh, we do have a floor, and we do, and that we are weak only in the buckle, not on the palatal. I would rather have to graft the buckle and the buckle only. The palatal tissues are very hard to maneuver around and to control. So we will favor the, uh, the palatal, keep it uh, thicker. And if we're going to uh, dehisce through any portion, it would be through the buckle. Now, when you introduce the, uh, the instrument, if you twist a lot, you will cut a lot. If you push a lot, you will expand more than cut. In this case, we really don't have a lot to expand, so I am going to uh, try to ream it. If the bone actually splinters, it's okay. We will graft it. That's the whole idea of today's exercise. We knew that it was going to uh, splinter, and we're going to go to four and a half as a matter of fact. And you see that the bone is slightly, slightly uh, moving. So as I design the positioning of the implant, I am taking into consideration that the shoulder of the implant will be placed within the crest. So the very top of the implant is going to be um, about two millimeters from the very top of the uh, crestal bone. Okay. The, there is no uh, opening in the sinus. The palatal wall is intact. The mesial wall is intact, and it has a spongy feel to it. You know, a cancellous feel. Therefore, we are not violating uh, the bone and getting into the root of the adjacent tooth. Okay, and the distal wall as well. We know that this is the apex of the adjacent bicuspid, and we are well away from it. So we will engage the inserter retriever which also has markings as to uh, the depth. You will see those when we zoom in a little closer. And these are at two and three millimeters. We want the implant to be between those two marks uh, um, from the crest. So as you see now, I can maneuver this implant. It is not a screw, but it can be twisted in place. That gives it more stability. And if you, if you look closely now, you see those two, two lines, the top of the crest, from the uh, mesial and distal, of course, um, is between uh, those two. So we'll take advantage of the need for grafting to reinforce the buckle plate to create a better gingival profile. So the blood, blood that we had collected is a coagulum, but that's not going to be a, an issue because we can break up the coagulum to moisten uh, the, uh, the graft. And we mix it quite a bit. We want to uh, break the surface tension 
at the mouth of all of these micro and nano porosities. So I can sort of uh, uh, have a, a reasonable expectation of the, uh, the final uh, bone graft to be w thoroughly imbibed. And that will sit beautifully there. Okay, we will use a retention suture. And that's a suture that will go uh, from the palate into the surgical site and then will go in the very depth of the uh, surgical opening. We'll take the autogenous bone, pack it over the shoulder of the implant and immediately at the surface of uh, the bone. So this layering helps create a uh, sort of an optimum uh, Q-tip, yes, fill that again. So we just lay it on top, it imbibes the excess fluid. We want to fill that gap right here. We want to uh, create the root eminence again, if at all possible, at least fill it so that upon a high smile, we don't have that dark shadow that is kind of, uh, you know, defeats the purpose of all of the work that we are doing. Then I will take a, uh, a chromic uh, 5 and and 4 chromic gut suture when the time comes to close it. First, I'll take a little more of the graft. I want to try to get that there. Okay. We will overfill it, as always, you will overfill uh, any graft area whenever you're using, you know, o uh, auto autogenous or uh, synthetic uh, grafting material. You want to overfill uh, it. If uh, you're using a non-resorbable membrane, the membrane must be a lot smaller uh, to be away from the incision, or better yet, you make your flap a lot bigger. Slowly and methodically, you will uh, position the suture so it becomes sort of a strap, a double strap on either side of the implant that will hold the membrane in place as well as uh, hold the graft underneath the membrane uh, positioned right around the implant. What I want to do is keep the, the head of this. It's okay. Okay, here we go. Okay. Once we get one of them, I will reposition that. It's the tedious part of the whole process, is this step. But it is crucial to, to be patient. It is crucial to do it properly. Otherwise, all of the work will go to waste. Now the graft and the membrane are secure. And that basically is the whole purpose of this exercise. You don't want to take your bite with the, with the suture. It's a pretty big suture. It's, it's 4-0. You don't want to take it right at the very tip. It will choke it. So we take it slightly below it when it starts to widen up. And there we are. We will use a figure of eight suture to strap it down in the center. Okay.
And um, this is where we have it. It's approximately uh, two and a half to three millimeters below the crest, well within uh, the tolerances that uh, is the shadow of the graph that we placed in there. And uh, as you see, it has a couple of millimeters away uh, from the adjacent uh, roots, and it is away from uh, the sinus. So we've achieved all of our goals. We did not compromise anything, not the placement, not the positioning, not the angulation. We did not have to go into the sinus. We were able to regenerate the uh, dental eminence for the aesthetic zone. Uh, what I will do for, the, for this case, we have, uh, as you see in front of you, two also four and a half by six millimeter implants placed in the area of the posterior left mandible and uh, that had required coverage of the shoulder with a uh, bone graft with membrane. They are placed exceedingly close to uh, the, uh, the posterior one, uh, at least, is uh, very close to the mental foramen. However, there, was, there is no um, paresthesia or any uh, neurological symptoms. So we will uh, go ahead and, and uncover the two. As soon as they are uncovered, the integration is verified. We will then, I'll turn it, turn it over to Dr. Uh, Morgan, who will uh, uh, proceed to take the uh, impression and shade and bite and, whatever is necessary for the final restoration uh, of these two implants. I will try to avoid a complete severing of the attached uh, uh, gingiva right at the neck of the adjacent cuspid. Here is the top. Uh, looking good. Looks real good. And just come right up, hugging the distal surface of this tooth. And we now see the top of this implant and the top of this other implant. Okay, and we see that there is bone all around. Okay, we will uh, just remove a little bit of that excess bone. Very nice, thanks for making us look good. All right, we'll clean up. We, you want to see a perfect round circle of the black healing plug. Screw in there. And that comes out. We will check the integration using uh, the guide pins. They sit solidly within the well of the implant. we we'll check them. They don't move. So what we will do is apply apical pressure and then twist. This is a five millimeter reamer that would allow us to sort of shape the, uh, the crest to match the shape of the hemispherical uh, base of the um, abutment that will eventually be used uh, for the integrated abutment crown restoration. Or for an, an, uh, the PFM restoration, you would still use a five millimeter diameter Bicusp uh, excuse me, abutment since this is a bicuspid. And then we will do the same for the posterior one. I will now take a um, temporary or even an impression post, which I could put in, and then suture around it. Good. And we will leave this part of the, uh, the flap open. This will granulate in and we will have additional attached gingiva by secondary intention. Okay, Dr. Morgan now is gonna go through uh, the exercise. I didn't see those fully and lock them into place of selecting uh, different abutment types, dif different restoration um, and so on. Uh, types and, and he will uh, show you again how to take the impression. Thank you, Dr. Daher. After taking the impression, 
the only portion that should come out into the impression material is the acrylic sleeve. Nothing could be simpler. It's nothing more than a round peg in a round hole. As I have mentioned before, I have grandchildren that are learning to write. Their teachers, in order to give them dexterity, will give them square pegs to put into square holes, triangular pegs to put into triangular holes, and round pegs to put into round holes. And for a four or five year old child, what shape do you think is the easiest to uh, negotiate? Clearly, it's a round peg in a round hole. And there it is. So you can see the two impression posts are in the, the implants and only the acrylic sleeves have been removed. So we'll take a little GC resin and we'll take a, just a minimal amount of acrylic on the acrylic sleeve. If it's too high, we can trim the acrylic sleeve or alternatively just take the impression on the, the impression post. Close. Is that too high? It oh, is yeah. oh, way too high. Uh -huh. So let's, let's just take it out. And once again, we can take the impression right on the impression post. Close. Always remember that the technician does not have a TMJ. So we also only use full arch impression material, uh, tr impressions. In fact, the Bicon Laboratory will not accept quadrant trays or triple trays. Open. And we'll replace the temporary healing abutments that Dr. Daher had initially placed. So the one suture that Dr. Daher has placed, we'll just hold that tissue in place near the canine. Uh, we could uh, consider a ridge splitting for the first case. The span mesiodistally is very tight. The other limitation is the way the curvature of the bone uh, was. It comes up to a very thick uh, uh, root uh, in the canine and another one in the bicuspid and the other limitation is by the time we get to the f to adequate width we are in the sinus so it would have had to be a combination of a, a ridge split and possibly a sinus lift uh, doing, the, doing that in a closed or a split thickness uh, technique would have been technically much more difficult uh, than the actual graft at the same time uh, it, this allowed us a, a chance to preserve the papillae. A ridge split technique in the aesthetic zone, as you know, uh, undermines the, uh, the uh, interdental papillae. So in, in this case, I feel it was a better choice for the, uh, uh, you know, the safety of the sinus and the protection uh, of the uh, dental papillae. Well, as you see, the, the ridge itself was, was exceedingly thin when we placed it. Uh, when we placed those two implants, we had a uh, ridge that was roughly three millimeters at the very crest. It was widening enough, but we couldn't go any uh, deeper because of the presence of the mental foramen. So we stopped at the mental foramen. We were left with about a third of the circumference of the shoulder and the first uh, plateau outside of the bone. So instead, we elected to do, a, again, a bone graft with a membrane. We used only autogenous bone and a resorbable membrane in there. Yeah. Um, yes, we do try to achieve the widest diameter implant within reason. You, you have uh, the latitude with the Bicon implant to get pretty close to the adjacent teeth. You get um, within one millimeter and you're fine. You can get within uh, even less than one millimeter from e either cortex and you will be uh, fine. You will have integration. Uh, the idea is uh, that we want to increase the surface area without having to use a much longer implant. So we try to get to a wider implant. Um, if the widest is four millimeters, so be it. If the widest is six millimeters, we will go after that uh, diameter. Um, 
Four and a half by six is adequate for any molar, for any bicuspid, five by six and five by five uh, as well, and uh, six by five and six by 5.7, all of them. Thank you again and have a great uh, rest of the day.